Hey everyone, Amy Wood here at 7 on Main in downtown Greenville. Senator Lindsey Graham is in town at the moment. Uh, you're gonna, you. I'm yes. sure be going back to Washington soon. Yes. You have a big tax bill that is looming. And we're waiting for it to be born. <laughs> yeah. So uh, hopefully this afternoon, this is Friday, we'll get the final details. But I'm excited about it. I think it's going to help working people. You're out there working, you got a couple of kids, it's about 2300 bucks to you. And from our business point of view, it makes us more competitive in our international economy by lowering the corporate rate to 21 versus 35. The international average for corporate taxes is 21. We're at 35. That doesn't work. Not competitive. Not competitive. All right, so tell me about the child tax credit situation. There's been a lot of conversation. Is Can your phone ringing? Yes. He's checking the phone. Yeah. But, uh, you got it? Hang on. Is it a big update for us? On no. Something important? Hopefully. Nothing as Nothing. important as this interview. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's keep on going and right. talk a little bit about the child tax credit that Marco Rubio right. has sort of stepped up there and said it's not big enough, it's not good enough. South Carolina has a lot of low-income families who <clears throat> probably care about that too. Well, number one, uh, the biggest change in the tax code for the average working family in South Carolina is if you're a couple, the first $24,000 you make is exempt from taxes. We doubled the standard exemption for 12, from $12,000 per couple to $24,000. Now, if you got kids, the child tax credit goes from $1,000 to $2,000. That's a big deal. Marco wants to make it more generous. That's okay. But one thing I don't want to do, I don't want to start uh, basically using general revenue to pay payroll taxes for individuals. So what Marco's talking about is if you pay payroll taxes, you're paying into your Social Security. Mm -hmm. Now, you're going to get your money back and then some, but Marco's saying, hey, I want to basically give a, a child tax credit for people who are paying payroll taxes. They don't pay any income taxes. The payroll taxes they pay goes into Social Security to help them with their retirement. I don't think we need to start having general tax revenue being used to pay people Social Security, even if it's for child tax credits. Count me out there. So you, you want it refined and sort of specified? I want to give a child tax credit to somebody who is paying taxes. <clears throat> if you're set up where you don't have any tax liability, I don't want to give you a bunch of cash because you already don't pay taxes. I'm worried about people are paying taxes. People are working. And the average family who pays taxes is going to get a $2,300 tax cut. Now it's not the time to start giving cash back to people who don't pay any taxes at all. If Rubio says, I won't vote for it unless we do this, <clears throat> is it worth it to do it? We have a problem. A $2,000 child tax credit is very generous. Uh, we got to worry about the debt. We go from $1,000 to $2,000 per child. And I want to help working people who are raising their kids, put more money in their pocket, have more money to raise their children, but we also got to worry about the debt. The main thing of the tax cut for me is to create more jobs. People are going to leave this country at 35 percent corporate rate. They'll go overseas where it's a lot cheaper. My main goal is to keep people here in the country, growing their business, and making sure that people are working for a living, paying income taxes, get some of their money back. So are you saying at all that you would not vote for it if they add in the child tax credit in a way that you don't support? Uh, I'd have a hard time supporting uh, using general revenue to pay somebody's Social Security taxes. Because when you pay Social Security, you're paying into the system where you get your money back. I don't think we're going to have to cross that bridge. I hope not. I want this tax cut really badly. From a Republican Party point of view, we better produce. We failed on health care. We're going to try again. But as Republicans, if we can't cut taxes, what good are we? We haven't had a major tax cut in 30 years. <clears throat> this tax cut is long overdue. We're going to make corporations in America competitive internationally to go to 21% like the world at large. And we're going to start helping people who pay taxes uh, lower the rates. And uh, if you're raising a couple of kids, give you a $2,000 child tax credit, not 1000 To me, I think this is good for South Carolina, be good for the economy. Some are writing articles about you and your relationship with President <laughs> yeah, Trump no. now that call you the Trump whisperer. <laughs> Do you feel like you are the Trump whisperer? Now you're golfing together, you're getting cell phone calls. Uh, well, nobody whispers with Trump. <laughs> you got to be loud with Trump. So he's the president. He beat me like a drum. I lost. So when uh, President Bush beat Senator McCain in 2000, I helped Senator McCain. We lost. Senator McCain and myself helped President Bush. After 9-11, we became all good friends. 
I tried to work with President Obama where I could, you know, fixing a broken immigration system. I owe it to this president to help him where I can. I owe it to the people of South Carolina to be helpful. And I also owe it to myself and the people of the country to push back when I think President Trump is wrong. I enjoy his company. He's a really good golfer, a lot better than I am. And we do talk a good bit. We talk about North Korea. We talk about Iran. Can you imagine being president of the United States today? You got a crazy man in North Korea hell-bent on getting a missile to hit America with a nuclear weapon on top. You got the Ayatollah in uh, Iran destabilizing the entire Mideast, taking all the money that Obama gave him under sanctions relief and building up his military. President Trump's got a lot of hard decisions to make, and I want to help him. You, you were quoted yesterday sort of giving the chances for military action yeah, in North yeah, Korea, yeah, yeah. which yeah. were pretty alarming <laughs> statistics. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about that. I you will. said 30% chance for us so, to have military action? This is not a science. It's just a gut feel. North Korea is continuing to march toward having a missile that can hit America with a nuclear weapon on top. They can hit America with a missile. They haven't perfected the nuclear weapon on top yet. Right. That's coming just a matter of time. President Trump has said, I will never let the marriage of a missile and a weapon occur that can hit America. So what I'm trying to do is tell the Chinese, don't call his bluff. Every American president before Trump talked tough to North Korea and everybody backed down, Republicans and Democrats. There's no, there's no other place to kick the, the can now, Amy. We're running out of time. If he gets a missile with a nuclear weapon on top that hit America, we're less safe. And I worry more about him selling the technology to people who would use it than maybe him using it himself. It's not a good deal for the world to give him an ICBM with a nuclear weapon on top to hit America or any other place. Donald Trump, as a last resort, will use military force to stop that. The Chinese could stop North Korea tomorrow if they wanted to. They've never believed a president would actually go to war to protect America against North Korea. This president, if he has to, will go to war. And why I say 30%, every time they test a missile, every time they test a bomb, North Korea gets closer to having the capability to hit the homeland, and that's what would lead to a war. You've said 70% if there's another launch, 70% chance of military action. 70% chance if they test another weapon. They're testing missiles, right. and they now got the capability to get a missile here. They're not yet, they do not yet have the capability to hit America with a nuclear weapon on top accurately. Every time they test a nuclear warhead, they get more capable. So if we read tomorrow, North Korea has another nuclear test of their warheads, then the time for Trump to react becomes even less. Then you go from what I think is three and 10 to seven and 10. China provides all the oil to the North Korean economy. They could stop this tomorrow if they believed Trump was serious. So you don't think they believe him? Clearly they don't. And all I can tell you, after having played golf with him, spent a lot of time with him, he is hell bent, President Trump, on making sure that Kim Jong-un can never hit America with a nuclear weapon. He's right to draw that line. He's drawn a red line. I have his back. I don't want a war with North Korea. It would be devastating to South Korea and Japan and North Korea. But if there's going to be a war with North Korea, it's going to be in China's backyard, not America's backyard. What does that look like? Military action in North Korea. What could Americans <clears throat> expect from that? An all-out war. There is no way to just bomb their nuclear facilities. They're too hardened. They're too dispersed. So when you fire the first shot, you just got to assume you got to take the regime down. We'll win. I mean, there's no doubt who wins the war between the United States and North Korea. We win. The amount of damage they could do in South Korea is great. They've got a lot of artillery pieces pointed at Seoul. They have a pretty big army. It's a, not a very effective army, but it's large. They have a lot of technology, they have a lot of missiles. A lot of people would get killed. A lot of people would die. That's the choice President Trump has. North Korea is making Trump pick between our American homeland and everybody over there. He's going to pick America over everybody over there. And if Kim Jong-un continues what he's doing, the war is coming in China's backyard. I hope China realizes the best way to avoid a war is for them to control North Korea. They could if they would. They just need to do it. 
We've heard a lot about how President Trump has inherited <coughs> this North Korea problem, that it has been yep. something that's gone on for administration after administration. Yep. Senators have been there in Washington <laughs> yeah. for all of this time, many of them. Right. Should have and could have the Senate done anything to make this a different scenario? I've been pretty consistent. The, my biggest fear is if North Korea gets a bunch of missiles and a bunch of bombs, they'll sell them to terrorists who will actually use them. Everything they've built in the past, they've sold. So you don't want this guy to have a big arsenal because he'll sell it. And I don't want to live our lives worrying about what he might do. I want to worry about what he can do. And if he doesn't have the capability to hit America, then we're, we're in good shape. Every president has talked tough. Every Republican and every Democrat before Trump has all said the same thing. They defy sanctions. Their program is very mature now. They couldn't do this without China's help. They wouldn't have any missiles or any bombs if China didn't help them. It's been our problem for 25 years. Trump's going to make it China's problem. He's going to make it Russia's problem. He's going to make it the region's problem. It's about time for an American president to make the threats we face from North Korea other people's problems, too. So you talk about North Korea during <laughs> golf. Yeah. All right, tell us what a, a golf game with President Trump is like in terms of business versus okay. pleasure. Right. Like, I mean, what yeah. percentage of the time are you guys talking issues? Okay, the first thing is fast. The guy plays incredibly fast. He's very charming, very gracious, and extremely competitive. So he always tries to fix the deal. He tries to, to give sh just enough shots to make sure he'll win. So the first thing I have to do is negotiate a good deal so I can be competitive. I have never beat him. He's got to get older and I got to get better. Playing golf with Donald Trump is a ton of fun. His golf courses are spectacular. He's a very good golfer and he plays with some of the best people in the world. I just played with Lexi Thomas's uh, brother, uh, Nick, and he shot a 66. So when I play golf with President Trump, I get a chance to talk seriously, but mostly have a good time. He loves golf. It's a break from the tensions of being president. I love golf. It's one of the few things I can do to get me away from my job. And Donald Trump is a talker, and I'm a little bit of a talker too. I have a lot of fun. But you're obviously making time. So where, where are these conversations about North Korea happening? In the golf cart? At the clubhouse? Well, we always eat lunch. So lunch is more about politics. <coughs> but I'll let, I'll let him kind of set the pace. Just out of the blue, something will come in his head that he wants to ask me about. And we'll have a conversation and we'll go hit the next shot. But anybody's ever played golf, it is a great place to do business. It's a great place to get to know somebody. And the one thing I can say about playing golf with President Trump, I think he knows me better. I know him better. We still have our differences, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Sometimes they're, they're pretty large. But I owe it to him to help him because he is my president. I owe it to the people of South Carolina to try to make him successful. And I also owe it to the people of the country to try to find a way to get things done. I think we may get something done on immigration. We're very close to a deal that would secure our border with a wall and take care of these Dream Act kids who have no place to go. We talk about that a lot. I think President Trump wants a deal. He has no animosity against these Dream Act kids. They came here as small children with no place to go. America's the only home they know, but he wants to secure the border and he has a right to want to secure the border. There may be a deal coming here fairly soon and only Donald Trump could have done this. Obama and Bush could never get it done. He has such credibility with the right of our party, the Republican Party, that if he came forward and said, I've got my wall, I've got a secure border, let's be fair to these kids, I think a lot of people would follow him. And if he could do that, that would be an historic moment. And it's a moment that you <coughs> have worked toward for how many years? I've been doing this since 2006. The Hispanic population in South Carolina is pretty small. I've been trying to, break, uh, to fix a broken immigration system. Why? I don't want 11 million here illegally 20 years from now. I want to secure the border. I want to control who gets a job. They come here to work, so I want to control who gets a job. I want to put employers in jail who hire illegals. I want the ones who are here to learn our language, pay a fine, and get in the back of the line. Uh, then I want a merit-based immigration system going forward, where we start giving green cards out to minor children and spouses. All these terrorists come in on these family visas where you can bring 30 and 40 people. I want to limit, limit who can come into the country on a green card to minor children and spouses, that gives you more green cards for a workforce that's in decline. 
we're living longer and we're having fewer children. We're going to need immigrants to come into this country. I just want to pick from all over the world based on the economic needs of the country. That's called merit-based immigration. That's what I've been wanting for 10 years. FCC takes away net <coughs> neutrality. Right. A lot of consumer concern out there about our costs going to go up sky high, uh, what's going to happen to the marketplace, what kind of ideas will be allowed to filter through the systems. <coughs> um, what's your take on that? I, I know you were, you were pro net neutrality going away. Yeah, here's what I worry about. The platforms are owned by you know, a handful of companies. Well, they put the time and effort to build these platforms. You know, uh, riding the internet, I want as many people to ride the people who build the, the platforms need to make money. I don't mind giving the companies more control as long as it doesn't become a monopoly. Here's the hard stuff. When do they consolidate the control over the internet so they price you out and you can't find competition? So right now cable companies uh, use telephone lines are buried underground. <clears throat> when you use a telephone pole to run a cable line over it, you pay the telephone company. I don't mind concepts like that. If you use somebody's infrastructure, you have to pay for it. And if you want more faster, you can pay for more faster. What you don't want to have is consolidation of power. So the people who run the internet providers also control the content. So the worst thing in the world is for the, the TV stations and the movie companies to own the distribution and the content because they become a monopoly. I don't know where it's going to go. Let's give this a chance. And if I smell a bunch of monopolies coming up, we'll fix it. Uh, we are doing a story tonight. FCC um, apparently had all this comment coming in that was actually manipulated <laughs> yeah, and spammed. Yeah. So it was all pro comments to uh, getting rid of net neutrality. When in fact, when you see the polling, 80% of Americans were against it going away. What's your take on that? They were cheating. Uh, they were cooking the books. I mean, I get so much input in my office. I want to know where, where is it coming from? You know, sometimes we get overwhelmed by, by things from California. I like the people in California, but I don't represent them. So as a politician, you got to realize that there are a lot of voices out there, but you eventually got to be true to yourself. So what, what I hope to see is that this 3-2 decision, which will allow Internet providers to have more control, uh, will see if it improves quality of service to the consumer. The way I look at these issues, I'm sitting on my couch at home. I want to get as much as I can get, as cheap as I can get it, but I'm not entitled to steal it. Mm -hmm. So I need to pay for a service. So I want, make sure, I want to make sure that Channel 7 is on cable, and is on direct TV, and that y'all work out a business relationship that you can piggyback on the way people get their news, the way they get entertainment. Uh, we don't have over-the-air broadcast. That's not the way most people get it anymore. They either get it through satellite, cable, or some version thereof. Now, what's changing? A big cable package is going to give way to a la carte. People are going to pay for what they want to buy, not what they have to buy. So I see a real revolution in terms of consumer choice. If you don't want to buy 100 channels, there'll be somebody who'll sell you exactly the channels you want to buy. My goal is for the consumer, consumer to have as many choices as possible, but you also got to make sure the people who spend the hundreds of billions of dollars to create these systems, that they can make money. And that's what it's all about. A balance between people who spend a lot of money developing the technology and the consumer wanting to use it. What about the Russians in Syria and the activity that's going on there? Are you really concerned? good question. Um, I like Trump's foreign policy in terms of North Korea. He's drawn a line in the sand that should have been done 25 years ago. He wants a better deal with Iran because the current one is really bad. They're going to get a nuclear weapon under the current deal, and we need a better deal because the Arabs want a nuke of their own, and you're on the road to Armageddon. Israel's never going to allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon because that could be the end of Israel. This is a bad deal. When it comes to Russia, the president has a blind spot. The last thing I want to see happen in Syria is for us to turn Damascus over to the Iranians. So what I hope Trump will do is break the Russians and the Iranians apart. I don't mind if the Russians have military bases in Syria. They've had them for 30 years. I do mind us turning Damascus over to a Russian-Iranian alliance, which means the war in Syria never ends. It means all the Arab countries around Syria 
will object violently because they don't want Iran to control yet another Arab capital. I don't think we have a strategy when it comes to pushing back against Russia and Iran inside of Syria. We've done a good job with ISIL, but the war will never end if the final product is for the Iranians, who are the mortal enemy of the Sunni extremists, if they control Damascus. And the last thing we want is for Russia and Iran to form an alliance to change the balance of power in the Mideast. So the president, in my view, needs to come up with a policy that will prevent Russia and Iran from winning the war in Syria. So, when you're golfing, yes. can you bring that subject I up? I do, I do. You do? I said, he said, well, what are we going to do? I said, what's winning, Mr. President? I asked him the other day, what's winning in Syria? Destroying ISIL, that's one. But what's winning? Here's what I would say. If Iran controls Damascus, then you've lost, and he agreed with that. He gets the fact that the Iranians are destabilizing the Mideast. What he doesn't understand, they couldn't do it without Russia's help, and he's got to get Russia to break away from Iran, and that means we're going to have to get tougher with Russia. We need to arm the Ukraine so that if the Russians try to take more of the Ukraine, the Ukrainians can fight back. We need to push back against Putin. He signed the sanctions bill. The Russians did interfere in our election, and we need to be tough with Putin because he, uh, he feels in vacuums where there's weakness. Putin uh, seizes the moment. He played Obama like a fiddle, Putin did, and I told Trump, when it comes to Putin, the only language he understands is strength. When you get to that part of the conversation and you make the point <clears throat> about Russia to the president, what does he say? He listens. All you can ask for is listening. He asked the best questions. I've spent time with President Bush, like him a lot. I respected President Obama, he's a smart man, didn't agree with him a lot. He has a beautiful family. President Trump, I've gotten more time with him than all of the other two combined. And the one thing I can say for the president, most people don't appreciate, he asked a ton of really good probing questions. He has a curious mind. And anybody with a curious mind, I think, can be a problem solver. Solver. If you don't have curiosity, if you don't want to know how things work and why things work, it's pretty hard to fix broken systems. He is more curious about the Congress today than he was during health care. He's done a better job with the tax bill than he did with the health care bill. He understands tax policy very well. He's spending time with senators as individuals. Let me tell you, he's a very charming man, and he's a good listener. So I see President Trump becoming much more comfortable in his job. The tweeting drives me nuts at times, and I would urge him that that's hurting him, that some of the things he says and the way he lashes out makes people feel uncomfortable about him as a person. The economy is growing strong. Uh, I think our tax cuts are going to help. America is stronger on the world stage. But one of the things that's hurt the president, I think, is some of the uh, outbursts on the tw uh, in tweeting. Uh, to, to one of your most favorite people in the world, John McCain, yeah. who is recovering or, yeah. or getting better in the hospital right now, what, what is this going to do to the health care vote? Do you have any timeline? Is there any Thanks, news Mark. on that? Well, we hope to take the tax bill up next week. I think we're going to lose Senator Corker. We can only lose one more. If we lose two more, we're in trouble. We want to take a vote before Christmas because we're going to lose a vote next year. John McCain is my dear friend. He's an American hero. He's suffering from the treatment. The actual disease is responding pretty well to the treatment, but the treatments are really tough. Yeah. So I'm praying for John. Uh, I hope that he you know, has another run in him. I believe he does. I believe he's going to be able to come back, come back strong. But next week is going to be interesting. We need every vote we can get on the Republican side. And I would say if we fail on taxes, that's the end of the party as we know it. Who would help us going forward? We promised to repeal and replace Obamacare and we failed. We promised to cut taxes. And if we fail there, I just think it will take the life and uh, wind and heart out of the Republican Party. But I'm more worried about the country than the party. The country needs a tax cut. Our businesses need to be competitive. Working people need more money in their pocket. I'm hoping every Republican will suck it up and do what's best for the country and the party. There's a million reasons to vote no on every bill. <clears throat> I don't think we have the luxury of failing here. You look misty-eyed. 
Yeah, I miss John. Uh, I can't think of anything I've done in politics where he, we didn't pretty much do it together. He's been a good voice on foreign policy. He stood up to evil consistently. Um, he's the guy that helped me understand a broken immigration system. So he's a dear friend, not just a political ally. Uh, he's 81 years old. He's lived an incredible life. He's been willing to die for his country. And what more could you ask of any individual? I hope and pray that he has a long time left with us. We need him, quite frankly. He wants to help the president when it comes to foreign policy issues. He voted for the tax cut. He understands the need for tax cuts. But it's not about John's vote. It's about John. You want John back? I want John back. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I'll keep him in our prayers. Thank you. Senator Merry Graham, yeah, Merry Christmas, and thank Merry you for Christmas. joining us. Thank you. Have a good holiday. You too. Thanks.